tonight on Roundtable. The core of Lois wasn't disliking Clark. It was being a reporter who was going to do anything to get the story. Marv Wolfman writer and co-creator of Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's a weird age we live in because I got to call my mom and ask her, hey mom, what did you think of Gorilla Grodd? And her response was, I didn't like him, he was mean to Barry. Jody Hauser, Eisner-nominated author of Faith and Mother Panic. I know DC better than I know Marvel, and sometimes I'm, I look at Marvel and I'm like, I don't even know where to enter. Cecil Castellucci, Eisner-nominated author of Odd Duck and Shade the Changing Girl. This was not a book intended just to feature everybody, that which would be like a giant Justice League comic. This had to change the entire DC universe at the same time. I mean, even when Justice League started, Wonder Woman was the secretary, because yeah. that's how they could excuse her being on the Justice League yeah. and how times have changed. Yeah, how times have changed. <laughs> Hopefully, and, we'll keep going. <laughs> and now she has a movie where she is actually referred to as a secretary as kind of a joke. Yeah. Because then they have to explain oh to her what that even means. Can we just take one second and talk about how great that movie is? I haven't oh, seen it oh yet. I haven't it's seen so it tomorrow. It's so good, Marv. It's so good. It's the movie we needed yeah. right now. But bring some hankies, because it's a weeper. What did the two of you, since you're much newer to it, how do you differentiate between what you write for, your, uh, for yourself or adding new characters to an already existing book and what's there? Do, what do you feel your needs are and what you have to do when you're using an old character and also what your needs are when you're introducing a new one into that uh, old sandbox? I mean, I think it really depends on the story, like what's going to work best for the story. Like, is there a character that already exists that we can bring back that isn't yeah. being used? Or is there someone, you know, is there, is there something, like you were saying, like there's a need to, to bring in a type of character who doesn't exist here and will sort of fill in a gap that's there. Yeah. So I think it really varies from story to story. Yeah. yeah, for me, for Shade, I only have two characters that are from the original, Melu. Um, who was um, Rack's girlfriend in um, the Ditko era, and then Rack, who my character is obsessed with. And those, I think of them as a tether, like to the original, you know, story. So it kind of, it sort of brings us, you know, it pulls in Ditko's world and it pulls in Milligan's world, but then everything else is completely like I've just created. And I think you need some flexibility for what editorial wants to do too. Yeah. And especially, you know, I'm doing a book in Gotham, so I'm not just dealing with the editorial and Young Animal. You know, the Bat Family office has a say too. Right. So for the first arc, they're like, can you put in Batwoman? And I'm like, cool, I love Batwoman. I'd be happy to do that. Right. But that wasn't necessarily something that came from me. And I might not have thought to do that on my own, but I'm really happy with how it came out. So I think part of it's being open to the collaborative with your, you know, the I've had artists who are like, I really want to draw Batman. Can you have Batman in the story? And I'm like, sure, cool. I'm, you're asking me if I can write Batman. I'm totally okay with doing that. <laughs> Today, we're more free to make more changes in characters than we ever were, partially because that's the way it is to the mass audience. Well, you found a need that didn't exist and that's what you do with already existing sandbox characters. You have to find something that isn't going to be conflicting with another character because they're the same. You have to find something that's going to add to the mix. And bring a new perspective, exactly. Yeah, totally. And question all the things you take, the writer even takes for granted because we come in with our own viewpoints and the way we'd like to see things. And if you just put in characters like that, the char they're not going to challenge you as the writer to start thinking differently. Yeah, at that point it sort of just becomes, you know, like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox yeah. and you want to have new voices and new influences and just new yeah. blood coming into the industry you want a lot and into of terms, the word. Uh, which you're not in which the readers are not expecting because you're not expecting. You're not setting it up in a way that oh, they're gonna see it coming down the four oh five for miles to come. <laughs> yeah. You know. So Shade the Changing Man was created by Steve Ditko in the 70s and then rebooted um, with Peter Milligan um, at Vertigo in the right. 90s. Um, and uh, and now it's Shade the Changing Girl. But I feel like, I'm, I mean, it's not even 100% clear that I'm in the DCU, you know. Um, I, you know, so I, I feel like I'm really in my own sort of bubble world. I will say that I did, um, a couple of years ago, 
DC did a, uh, a young romance issue where they had like short ro Valentine's Story that, yeah. yeah stories, and I did an Aquaman and Mira, and I really wanted it to be something very romantic. So I found so the story is that like she finds all these like. Um, romance letters, you know, that are tucked away in the lighthouse that they're living in. And it's like, she imagines her and, you know, Arthur, like, you know, these, like, you know, <laughs> storm swept 1800s, you know, lovers, you know, that were like kept apart. And that was like a fun way to sort of be in continuity, but not be in continuity, because it was just sort of like a small domestic moment, like a small romantic domestic moment that they have during this big, you know, storm. But um, but Shade feels very much, I mean, it's like, talk about sandbox. I mean, that's like a completely open sandbox. I mean, like, you know, I've plucked things from the Ditko run and from Milligan run sort of, you know, to have echoes, but I don't even think of it as a straight sequel. I think of it as a, um, a side quill. You know, it's sort of, if you've read Ditko or Milligan, then you you'll see what I'm doing, but you don't need to know anything about those at all. So it feels very different. These are all characters that have been around and they're sort of, right, they right. still have a lot of that baggage from the time period they were created in, and you bring in a fresh new character who is of the moment. Well, how do you yeah. feel? I mean, isn't that what you're kind of doing with Mother Panic? I, it is kind of what I'm doing with Mother Panic. I mean, one of the sort of focus points we had when we were developing the character, she was already partially in progress when I came on. Uh, Gerard Way and Tommy Lee Edwards had a lot of the bones there and I was sort of adding a lot of musculature and flesh to the skeleton. Where, is, where does she appear? Uh, she's in the Young Animal books okay. uh, at DC, but she's in Gotham. So she's okay. a brand new character who's in Gotham, which is a city full of vigilantes already. Yes. So doing something new is, it can be a little tricky there. But we sort of were looking at her like, what if Batman didn't exist? What if this was a type of character that was brand new in this city and was created in 2016, like what would that character look like? And you know, we were pulling a, a lot from like what celebrity is in the modern era. You know, it's you know Bruce Wayne these days. If he was a brand new character, he wouldn't necessarily just be like charity banquets and you know <laughs> sipping champagne. But it's actually grape juice. You know, so we have Violet Page who is you know followed by the paparazzi and she's like punching photographers and she's disappearing and everyone's right. talking about how she's in rehab and you know she gets in social media wars with her ex girlfriend and stuff like that. So it's sort of a trying to bring a very modern feel to a city that's been around for so long and that's actually part of the plot because a lot of what's been going on in Gotham in recent years you know things with like the Court of Owls it's like very much entrenched in Gotham's history mm -hmm. and a lot of the strength in Gotham and its villains is its history so you know it's not just Mother Panic who's coming in and is new and fresh but the villains that she's dealing with are the people who are like you know we're not of the old power you know, rankings, we want to find our own place in Gotham, we're going to wreck shit until we, we achieve what we want. So it's kind of coming on both sides with bringing something new to the table. One of those things, then maybe I'm a little bit different, I, I work to do the t type of story I intend to do, but I know I don't own it. Right. And I know, you come onto Superman, there's no way you're going to believe that you created it in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. You can add to it. You can't do right. anything else. And so if you're doing something, you have to expect, like you had the ability to make changes, the person who follows you has that same ability. Right. I never read any of my characters that I created after I leave it. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't ask, when I took on Teen Titans, I didn't ask the previous writers of the Teen Titans right. what I should do. Right. I did what I wanted to do. And it would be, the, for me, the height of hypocrisy to then turn to the next writer and say, well, you now have to follow everything I did because I created this character, this character, that character, and you have to do it the way I did, because I didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we took a young kid who worked with Batman who was nine years old or 10 years old when we started the book and immediately turned him to 18 or 19 years old and changed his name. <laughs> I didn't ask Bob Kane if that was acceptable. Right, right. We got an approval. So you have to, you have to be, you just have to worry about the material you're doing, be honest with the material you're doing, and hope that the people who follow you are equally honest uh, to the material. Because I don't look at it. Yeah. I just don't. When you um, get the care of a character, you're building on the legacy that what yeah. that came before you, and the, and that is what all of these, like the the line of writers you know, that have brought to, you know, to it, whether or not it's like every 25 years, like in, with Shade, or like if it's like every, you know, every month or every well, year. Well, I've always said that I believe that every generation needs their own characters, aim for them. I, I had it by accident because I grew up 
just at the time when the Silver Age started, so the new Flash came out. Mm -hmm. And I bought that first issue of Showcase, I think it was Showcase 4, that the new Flash was introduced in, and I bought all the uh, subsequent ones, and then he got his own magazine. I didn't know there was a previous Flash. Mm -hmm. It was canceled when I was like two, <laughs> you know, something like that. I had no idea any of these characters existed, and even though the Flash in that first story is reading a copy of the Flash comics from the <laughs> 1940s. I thought that was just a joke. Right, right. <laughs> and That's amazing. So, you know, I was completely unaware. They didn't feel that they had a need to use the old characters. It ju you were allowed to introduce something mm -hmm. new. And with a book like Teen Titans, the, it existed in two different versions prior to my doing right. it and George doing it. And I had no problem going, I'm only going to use these characters, but uh, the rest of them I'm going to create. Now that they're created, they become part of the whole, right, right. and the people after me have to make that same decision. What are they going to do with Raven? What are they going to do with right, Cyborg right. Or, or the others? And I cannot get involved with that, right. even though they're my creations. Right, right. I just don't read anything that I created yeah. afterwards, because mm -hmm. it's unfair to the people that someday I may, because they're all friends in one yeah, fashion yeah, yeah. or another, I may meet them at a party and they'll go, so what do you think of uh, right. Teen Titans? And I'll go, doesn't sound like any character I ever wrote. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Worst thing, of course it's not right. gonna sound of like any character not, yeah. I wrote. I have the voices in my head. You can't read into my yeah. head. So you have gotta write the characters the way you think it's yeah. being written. And everything I did has been reprinted. You can, you can find my versions of them. Now it's the next person. Yeah. So you hope that you get someone good following you and that they can make a success out of it or do it better. I had that happen to me too. I created Bullseye at uh, Marvel on, on, um, in Daredevil. And I thought it was a great character. I used him a couple of times. But then Frank Miller did it, and he did it far better than I did. <laughs> so you have to assume some people are going to come mm -hmm. in and do it better. Some mm -hmm. people are going to do it the same. Jumping in with like a new character for you that everyone already knows, like what has your experience, I guess, been like with that? Like, what was, was there a lot of pressure, or was it just more fun than anything? You know, I, I started. Uh, loving these characters when I was like five years old and watched The Adventures of Superman on TV. So coming in and writing Superman was sort of a dream. And the fact that he had been around at that point for 25 years or whatever else really didn't mean much. Uh, I knew the character, I knew the concepts, and you can always find something new to explore, a new approach, a new way of handling it. and. Since every time period changes, so Superman in 1938 is not the same character as he is in 1945, and he wasn't the same character in 51, and by the time I did it in 69 or whatever it was, you evolve to the time period and to the type of character that is popular in fiction at that particular point that you're writing it. So there's always new things to find. You just don't violate the core tenets of a character, but you keep finding new ways of approaching it, and I love that. For me, um, you know, I wrote a one shot of Wonder Woman um, and Lois Lane, and Lois Lane is one of my most favorite characters on the planet, like, cause she's- Oh, you'll hate me when I come, <laughs> with my next statement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when I wrote this, and it, it was Wonder Woman and Lois Lane, I just felt this like great honor to like be playing with these characters, you know, that like I had, I had played being when I was, when I was growing up, and I think that's, that's part of the interesting thing, but I really like what you're talking about, about how these iconic characters, they change as society changes as well. Like what they mean and how they are a man or a Superman or a Wonder Woman, you know, in these time periods are different. I mean, I grew up reading my dad's Silver Age comics with Batman, where it's like Batman gets turned into a photo negative and light is eating him, or like a caveman has been thawed out and is rampaging through Gotham. And it was just like really weird, goofy stories. And and the Batman that was like coming up in movies at the same time is com the complete opposite of that. Um, so I kind of love that there were these characters that just had so many different versions and yet all of them sort of felt right in their own way because it was reflective of the time. What were you gonna say about Lois? Okay. <laughs> now, I like Lois now and I've written stories with Lois the way I like to see her as mm -hmm. opposed to the way she was. But for many, many years when I was growing up, Lois was this character who loved Superman, right. who put down Clark. Yeah. And she really thought Clark was useless. 
and it, I always thought she was ridiculous. I always, you know, <laughs> here's this guy, he's six foot four, he's broad shouldered, he's handsome, pretty much as mu handsome as Superman. He's as big, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporter, and she doesn't like this guy because he's sort of quiet, but he's a definitely a good guy. She's going for the superhero. So when I got a chance to work on Superman regularly as opposed to just isolated stories, I created a character, Cat Grant, uh, who's been on Supergirl recently. She was on uh, Lois and Clark before that. Oh yeah, I remember but, that. But uh, her entire attitude, as far as I was concerned, was she thought Clark was a real catch. She thought Clark was great. He was smart, he's handsome, he's a good guy, he's a good writer, he's everything. I wanted a character who liked Clark, because if you don't like Clark, yeah. it's fake that you like Superman. Yeah, I totally agree with you, actually. And, and like what I think is really interesting about Lois is I feel like she has this um, sort of uh, fundamental dilemma that ladies have, you know, where it's like the, you know, the boy you should like and the boy you shouldn't like, you know? And I, and I kind of, I've always, I think, if I were to ever get to write Lois Lane, like that's that's one of the fundamental questions that I would um, that I would want to grapple with because I think I I 100% agree with you. But the question that I have with Superman and Clark is why would he pursue somebody who didn't like him? <laughs> what? Why does anybody pursue? Yeah. No, why does Superman? I think that's the most Super human thing he does, yeah, though. Exactly. But Superman does not have a you know, a, 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 a self-loathing complex or anything. He's got to know he's a good guy. Why would he continue to go after this person and purposely <laughs> set himself up to look like an idiot? Because he'd trip, he'd fall, he'd say stupid stuff, all this stuff. Why would he do that uh, to, to catch this person? It, was he forcing her to like Superman and not him? What was going on? And that's why those, those stories, that's why those stories bothered me. Yeah. And when I was a writer, I was able to change it. I did a story, it's never seen printed, it's one of my favorite Superman stories of all time that I wrote, at least, uh, to explain why Clark fell in love with Lois. We don't even approach why Lois likes Clark, but right. why Clark really uh, likes Lois. And the setup was he had read all of her articles mm -hmm. for years because he's from uh, Smallville, she's been in Metropolis, and he fell in love with the writing mm -hmm. before he even meets her. And he falls, he fell in love with her honesty, every, all of her good points. And when he finally meets her, it's sort of like, you know, eyes, eyes boggle out and all that uh, ooga ooga <laughs> stuff because he didn't expect, he didn't know what she looked like. Right. He was just, he loved the character that he read. He loved who she represented and the true Lois that's inside, all to get rid of that Lois who was so flighty and silly. And when I did my little story, like it was like Wonder Woman and Lois Lane, and they they have you know Lois has to do an interview with Wonder Woman, and Wonder Woman's like, I don't want to be here. This is dumb, you know. And um, I, you know, I'm not a puff piece. And Lois Lane is like, I'm a serious journalist. I don't want to do a puff piece on mm. Wonder Woman. Like this is stupid. And then an alien attacks, and they both <laughs> have to like fight together to like sa you know save the day and then they're like oh all right you i see you now as a woman like i see you in, in, in a different way and that's that's what was interesting but that's what i think is so great about getting to play in these sandboxes is that like i said before like these characters are so flexible like you can do you can color with them in so many different ways it's they're the modern mythology absolutely yeah, yeah. to me the core of lois wasn't disliking clark it was being a reporter who was going to do anything to get the story right so the part i didn't like i could fix but the part that i did like that's the, what I focused on, her ability to get a story, her ability to put herself at risk to get a story. You always have to figure out what the emotional core of your main character is and the characters that already exist and what is missing mm -hmm. from that group. Uh, so for Cat Grant, it was I wanted someone who was going to bring Clark out of uh, his blue suits she immediately started redressing him, <laughs> much more up to date. He didn't look like he belonged in 1952 anymore. Uh, she was outgoing, she was a gossip columnist to begin with, so she was really out there, really in your face, and that forces Clark to react in a very different way. And he liked the fact that she liked him. But then there was the other side to her. 
she had a very bad marriage, she had a kid, she had uh, an ex-husband who was after her, all this sort of stuff that you learn within the first year of her appearance. You don't learn it uh, day one. But her strength was a strength that was not in the book beforehand. Her reason and the way she, min uh, the way she dealt with everybody was something that was, in my, in my mind, missing. We needed somebody who not only liked Clark, but was a very different type of character. All the Superman characters back then were pretty straightforward. You had Clark, Lois, Jimmy, Perry. They were all good guys. I've been tremendously lucky. Um, starting with Blade, I guess, uh, something like 15 or 20 different characters or either in TV shows, movies, or make pop-up appearances in different places. And it's thrilling each time. Um, Blade, uh, the first movie, was definitely the character that I had created uh, for Tomb of Dracula. Then Bullseye appeared in the Daredevil film, and though the film wasn't great, I thought, he was, I thought Colin Farrell was phenomenal. Then you start to see things like Deathstroke and Arrow, or Vigilante and Arrow, or Cat Grant in a number of different uh, uh, venues. And you see them and you go, they are as close as I can possibly have expected. One or two may not be, but for the most part, I've been really lucky that the characters are so close. And I've met a number of the actors who have played them, and they all really care about the stuff. I mean, I, I, I had a lunch recently with one, and I won't mention the name, but he was so interested in just probing the creation of the character, the uh, how I would put, put him together, all of this stuff, even though he knows that he's going to be doing the character that the writer and the, uh, and the director want. But he wanted to know the core of the character. And when you can get an actor who cares that much that they want to go back to the original and just understand it so they could bring whatever it is into the current version and it's going to be a different version, it means it's going to be close in some fashion. If the actress that um, plays Faith, like if she was like, hey, let me know, Jody. Like, what would you what would you say to her? I would say the core for Faith is that she's someone who truly believes that heroes can make a difference. Like, she grew up reading comics and watching sci-fi and superhero movies, and that was something that she took away. And then she actually got superpowers and was able to, like, live the life like she saw on screen in the pages for you know, since she, before she could even talk probably. And, you know, that was something that was just so inherent to her and when she actually had the ability to help people and make a difference, there was no question that she was gonna do that. So for me, it's just sort of that optimism and that belief that, oh, I have the ability to make a difference. That's the only option that was ever open for me. Star Wars is the reason why I became a writer. Like, you know, that, like, when I saw A New Hope when I was seven, it, like I, it was like all of a sudden I understood that it was someone's job to tell a story, and that's that was the day that I committed myself to this sacred journey of becoming a, a, a storyteller. I feel like you learn more about a character the different ways that you engage with them. Yeah, every time because there has to be so much personal stuff in a novel that you don't have room for in a 20-page mm -hmm. comic, you learn a little bit more about the character. Interior you can create life, a little yeah. bit more about the character. When you're doing a novelization, I did last year's Suicide Squad and before that, Ark of Night, uh, I was able to create situations that got me into those characters a little bit stronger. And in the case of the Rogue One adaptation, I think some of the things could have worked fine on film, but there just wasn't necessarily room for them in the movie as done, so I got to do the sort of the impetus scene for the entire story where Galen convinces Bodhi to carry the message. And like nothing in the movie would have had, like nothing in the entire Star Wars franchise from Rogue One on would have happened if that moment hadn't happened. Right. And sort of getting to write that moment and how I saw that moment playing out. Um, I mean, that's the really cool thing with playing in a world that exists is you can add the things that you think are so important. And for Rogue One, it's like I have the movie itself, I have the novelization, which of course has additional scenes. I got a 11 page, I believe it was, document from Gareth Edwards of stuff he'd wanted to put in the movie or other ideas he had that would be cool for the comic. And then of course there's my own ideas I'm putting in. So I'm sort of like seeding it from yes. all these different arenas and just trying to make one coherent product at the end. And I've, I've actually wrapped on the scripts for that and Lucasfilm seemed like they were pretty happy with what I did, but it was actually kind of fun having 
these influences from all these different arenas and just trying to distill it into one. So the director gave you notes as well? Well, they gave, I went through Lucasfilm and it came to me, so I didn't talk to him directly, but yeah, I had like a whole list of oh, that's a, suggestions. That is an incredible benefit to write those things. And honestly, my favorite note was uh, you know, uh, talking about, which in the comic is the second issue, but when they're heading to Jetta City, he's like, maybe there can be space camels. And I'm like, yes, I don't know what space camels look like, but we are fucking putting space camels in because that's my favorite note I've ever ever gotten for anything. <laughs> I didn't do an adaptation, I just was like given like Princess Leia has to do an adventure between these two movies and like what do you want it to be and so like I just had to like come come up with yeah, that. Yeah, because at the end of Empire she's not a captive. No, she, she's, she's on the medical ship with yeah. Luke and, um, and uh, you know. And, and the next and we see her, she's a captive in a slave suit. No, she first shows up as uh, as the Boosh, the f Does bounty she? hunter. Yeah, she yep. poses as the she bounty hunter to bounty try hunter. to rescue oh, her. And she gets yes, captured. Yes. That's how she gets into the slave outfit, Marv. If you read... If you read Moving Target and then you rewatch Return of the Jedi, it completely changes the way you watch a bunch of scenes in that movie because all of a sudden you have all this extra information, which is the co the cool yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean that's kind of a bit of what I did with the Orphan Black comics because they wanted it to be partially an adaptation, so they wanted scenes from the TV show, but then they wanted a lot of, you know, things that would have been background or flashbacks mm -hmm. that there just wasn't room to put in the TV show. So it is kind of like the extended edition in a way. Yeah. But it's interesting how like how like sort of multi-tiered all these things are so that it's like you can just engage with the story in the one way, but if you engage with all of the stories, then you get sort of the complete picture. But it's not necessary, but it's also like fun. I Again, guess. it's sort of like the options for the fans, like yeah. what and what level do they want to engage with the story and how deep do they want to go? Yeah. A lot of fun. <laughs> A lot of fun, cheers to I fun. Like I like playing <laughs> with the characters. Cheers to fun. <laughs> yeah because of the comic book TV shows, like my mom actually cares about some of the stuff I'm writing. She always cared about what I'm writing, I shouldn't say that. But she's familiar with some of the characters I'm mm -hmm. writing because she watches the Flash TV show. So when I co-wrote a one shot with Killer Frost, she knew who Caitlin Snow was because she's a character on the show. I mean, and it's a weird age we live in because I got to call my mom and ask her, hey mom, what did you think of Gorilla Grodd? And her response was, I didn't like him, he was mean to Barry, which is like the most perfect mom right. answer ever. But you know, it's just, she she has. She knows these versions of the characters, but she's still willing. I mean, essentially because I wrote it, you know, to take a look and see the different version in the comics. And I, and for people like that, it's, you know, if you know someone who loves the Supergirl show, you can give them a Supergirl comic yeah. that's not the same version, but they, they yeah. know the bones of it. Yeah. We used to say all the time, every issue is somebody's first mm -hmm. issue. I hadn't read a Marvel book in a long time, and I, I was there for a lo forever, you know. Uh, and I picked up a copy of one of their books, I won't say what it is, and no place in that book was the character named. <laughs> I didn't know what his name was. I had no idea who the lead <laughs> character was because he wasn't named. And I'm going, no, that's, you've just turned me off to the whole thing. We have to remember to be reader friendly. Mm -hmm. That's a note I've gotten from, I think both Marvel and DC and Valiant editors is, you know, cause I'll turn in the initial script and they'll be like, okay, can you, you referenced a couple characters names, but can you have like this character's name like on the first or second page? Mm -hmm. And it sometimes it makes the dialogue a little bit awkward cause we don't necessarily say like, so Cecil, what are you, you know? <laughs> and we never use people's names for the most part if you know them, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, but sometimes, but. You're not yeah, writing for yourself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, there's just that like little bit of like, oh, that's not how people talk, but I know someone needs to know what this person's <laughs> called. But you know, people don't in. fly yeah. in yeah. the X-ray vision in. either. Yeah. So yeah. I don't worry. I don't, yeah, I don't know why that's like, like oh, superpower's fine. Wait, she's calling her boyfriend by his first name? Like, what? I can't deal with that. No, that's not how reality works. No, so. you try to come up with a thing if you're, if, if you're Iris, and you're speaking to Barry and you, you go, oh, Barry, you idiot. You know, something yeah, like that. Exactly. You work it so that it is a natural phrase, but you get that name in as fast as you possibly can. And then you don't have to worry about writing clunky dialogue. One of the books I was writing for Marvel, which was actually an adaptation uh, for the Maximum Ride books by James Patterson, they not only wanted the characters' names, and there were five of them in the first couple pages, they wanted them to demonstrate their powers in the first couple pages so people mm -hmm. could sort of have an idea of not only who they were, 
but what exactly it was that they could do. So that was always sort of an interesting challenge. It's like, well, let me just find a reason for this one girl to be underwater talking to fish because that's a thing she does and it's kind of cool. But you but know, if the you fish talk to her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you could go underwater and talk to fish, wouldn't you just do that sometimes for fun? So you know, no, I would definitely talk to a whale. Yeah, you know, because they they're supposed to be smart. Yeah, so. but but if you can talk to fish, can you talk to whales because they're mammals? Well, I guess what I'm saying is I would rather talk to a whale. <laughs> you would trade all the fish for the whales. I would trade the fish for the whales. That's fair. Just so you know, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Well, I'm glad I know something more about you yeah. now, Cecil. <laughs> I have a question. And I just use your name, so anyone Yay! just tuning in Five. across the table. <laughs> So I'm actually working on my first big event right now, which is kind of fun. I did a one shot that was an event tie-in last year that I co-wrote, but I'm essentially headlining an event for Valiant, which is called Faith and the Future Force, which is a reference to a 90s Valiant book, but it's essentially like a big epic time travel event that has everyone in the Valiant universe showing up at some point. So. That, I'm finding that to be super intimidating just because there's so many moving parts and there's not, this is an event with a bunch of other books that are coming in, it's just me, but there's still all these pieces that right. I have to work with and make sure I put back in the right place. Um, so that's, can you talk a little bit about your experience working yeah, with events? Because I feel like, yeah, I feel, you like, I feel like you have some experience yeah, doing that. Yeah, and you said you, like, you got <laughs> yeah. that ball rolling. Well, but, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths is the first of them. It was, something that I had submitted an idea for uh, when I got back to DC. I was at Marvel for eight years. I was the editor-in-chief and came back to DC and suggested this as a way of uh, possibly trying to strengthen their universe and try to make it easier for people to understand it because it was getting very, very complex. And the sales between DC and Marvel, um, they were so far apart. Uh, today they're all about the same, so one month DC may be on top, uh, the next month Marvel is. But um, back in 1982, uh, this, the difference was uh, enormous. Marvel was way up there and DC was, uh, was not, unfortunately. And, they ha and that's the company that I loved when I was growing up. And those are the characters I loved. So I really wanted to see something special. The, the trick for me, and, uh, was taking the time to actually figure out how to service every character, how to service all the history, and make all the changes. Because we would go, this was not a book intended just to feature everybody, that which would be like a giant Justice League comic. This had to change the entire DC universe at the same time. And you're working with all the different writers, you're working with all the different editors, and you're working with everybody. So it's very intimidating, but the only way you can get around it is to very carefully plan it and work out your story structure and work out how each character comes in and leaves and what their effect on it and to make sure every character can do that. These days, I don't know if you have the time. Back then, I had a couple of years. Mm. Uh, I proposed it, and then I proposed that we do this for DC's 50th anniversary, which was 1985, and I proposed it in something like 1982. So we had some time, and I was able to slowly make sure that all the T's were crossed, all right, the I's right. were dotted. But if you just rush into it without an actual plan, and I think if you do these things without a, an end result that is clear um, and needed, it becomes so obvious to the readers that it's not something that's of any importance. Right. We knew what we were gonna do, it was gonna be big, it was gonna change characters, it was gonna change the entire universe, so we had to make sure that the readers knew this was going to be the biggest thing they've ever seen in comics. Since that one, did so well and totally changed the entire sales structure of the, of, of the companies around in so many ways, that became the standard and I don't think that's a good idea. We had a purpose and I created that story to fill the purpose right. and just to do them becomes repetitive. You have to have a real reason to do these things otherwise it becomes yet another expected story. It's like the next issue, oh we're doing another one of these again. But if you have a reason to it, and if it's going to have some major and somewhat lasting effect, then there's a reason to do it. And there's a reason to spend the time to do it properly. Do you think people get fatigue from, um, like, from events, but also the fact that, like, 
you can't, like one, you know, I like comics and I read comics, yeah. you know, but I, sometimes I find, you know, like I know DC better than I know Marvel. And sometimes I'm, I look at Marvel and I'm like, I don't even know where to enter, you know? So I, rather than figure it out, I'm just like, okay, well, I guess I just am not gonna enter. And I, I find that like sometimes the fact that I have to read 12 stories in an order to understand one yeah. story makes that, for me, makes me sort of disengage rather than yeah. engage. What would be the one thing that you would like say is the most important thing to consider when in my career, you know, like uh, I would be doing an event? What's the what's the best? What's the most important thing as a writer that I, that we should know? Does that make any but sense? No pressure. Yeah. No, no pressure. pressure. Tell no me pressure. everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, the answer is to make sure that the story has a purpose. Right. Uh, it's just not another issue. Uh, if the story has a purpose and you can fit the characters in logically and try to create situations where each character has emotional needs within the story or mm -hmm. it affects them on an emotional basis, then you've got uh, the basis covered. Um, but you use the characters to help propel the story like you would any character. But here, because it's such a gigantic storyline, there needs to be a reason therein, and the best way is always finding the most personal reason to get into it. Um, and the other thing is to make sure none of the characters agree with each other. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, they could all be on the same exact side, but if they don't agree with how to proceed, like you would with your friends, you have five friends and you're going to a movie and everyone wants to see a different movie, it allows you to actually have exposition in terms of argument, so it becomes a character-driven scene rather than an exposition scene. Wow, I think you just solved a problem that I have in the next script that I need to write. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Who do you write for? Because like, I mean, when I'm writing Shade, I'm writing for Marley, you know, who's the artist, the amazing artist, Marley Zarcon. Like, she's the person that I'm writing for because I want, her, I want her to like the story. Like, so if she like, if she likes the story, then I think I'm okay. It's like I only write for her. I mean, if it's an artist that I've worked with already, and I sort of know that I'm writing to them, but a lot of times for the work for hire books, I'm coming on board and writing an issue or two before we even have an artist nailed yeah. down. So oh, at that point, I'm writing for me. I'm like, wow, this what's is that the like. That would freak me out. Like I've always known who my artist is. I mean, I've uh, I've sort of had to develop a scripting style that's very flexible, and I, which I want to do anyway because I always want to leave enough room for an artist to be able to contribute as much to the storytelling as they want, but not leave it so open that they're doing an unfair share of the work. It's oh, yeah. like sort of. So I've worked really hard to find that balance, and I've gotten a lot of feedback from artists when I needed more info or I gave you know was dictating too much. So I've mostly just tried to listen to all the different artists I work with and come up with a scripting format that works for whoever's coming on board. And then when I know, when I've worked with a specific artist for a while and I know like what they like drawing or which characters they're more into and they like doing this type of emotion, that's when I'll sort of cater that toward them as much as I can. Yeah, I think for me it's even less like, I'm pretty much fine with doing anything to any character at any point um, because I'm a terrible person and it's fun. But it's I think more the exterior. <laughs> I don't think that's true, Jody. I don't think you're a terrible person. But it is fun. A cool uh, one as a writer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, but there is sort of right, a terrible person as a writer. I think it's but not a terrible writer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is sort of like the exterior forces start. You know, you start wondering like my friends who love this character are they going to be mad at me for what I do? I think that's you more intimidating. Yeah, I know. You yeah. can never worry every about that. Every time I sit down to start writing something, I get really nervous. I mean, you know, most of the stuff I do is my own stuff. But like any time I do anything, I'm like, oh, and then I'm like. Oh wait, someone's already super mad at me and thinks this is the worst thing that was ever written. That's so, true. Yeah. That's true. Like, if you're not and, making and someone well. angry, you're not doing good work. Yeah, it's like, but even before you write the first, like you know, page one, panel one, someone's angry. Yeah. Like someone's already There's gave you one star. There's somebody always angry. Yeah. There's somebody yeah. always angry and somebody always willing to uh, attack you for any reason yep. possible, and you just got to get past that because. They exist for that reason. They don't exist to help you along or whatever else. But you know, it's going to bother you anyway. Yeah, and they're going to say dumb things like no you use too to. many adjectives. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'll, really? I mean, on the plus side, deadlines scare me a lot more than any fan reaction. So I will always get the work done because, like, an editor yelling at me is worse than like a million fans yelling at me. It, it's interesting because it's like I just, I just haven't really 
pitched myself or pushed myself to do lic licensed work. So the little things that I've done, I've always felt much more comfortable doing like one shots. I like it when I'm on the, on the outside. That's sort of where I feel comfortable and that's where I feel I thrive. So it's like shade, even though it's a character that I don't own, there's no other um, editorial at DC that's telling me, well, in Valleyville, this is what they do, because I made Valleyville up, you know? So mm. it's like my own little world, and I feel like I thrive there, so. I like more restrictions, which is like a weird thing. No, that's um, good but to sometimes, know yourself, yeah. Sometimes I think when there's more rules and more limits on what you can do, that sort of takes some of the stuff off the plate so you can really focus on the areas you want to, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, because that, that other stuff's already been decided, so you don't even have to think about that other than knowing where it is and what's in place. And like, this stuff is the stuff you get to play with so you can have more time and more energy to focus on that stuff and making it as cool and different as you want. What do you think like Faith would be like 25 years from now or like any of the characters yeah. that you have written? Well, I mean, I think for one thing with Faith especially, I hope in 25 years like the press isn't totally just focused on her body type yeah. as if that's super unusual. Yeah. Uh, or you know, really out of place in comics. I want it to. I want comics at that point to be just so diverse and so welcoming to everyone that people are just really focused on the core of the character and who she is and her personality. You know, if a character is just interesting because of one facet of who they are, like how they look or their sexuality or their gender, you know, they're, that that's not going to sustain a story for very long. Yeah. You know, it might get people in for an issue or two, but they're not going to stick around because, especially these days in comics where you have so many more diverse voices coming in, there's, there are better options out there for them. I've done so many of the standard characters because uh, I did most of the Marvel characters when I was there. or. Uh, or others, but I always felt that I understood them before I started, so I didn't ask anyone else. Right, because right. I also didn't, well, at Marvel, I probably would have had more of a reason because we all stuck to Stan's style, Stan Lee's style of writing. And of course, I worked directly with him, so it was easy to get that sort of communication. But later on, it was more of, I had different ideas from what was done in the 60s, and it's now the 80s and we have to change them. I've sat down and I've had lunch with a lot of the writers who have picked up on some of my characters, but it's always under the thing, here's what I did and here's why I did it, but please find your own, own way of handling this. Because or if you're just doing my version, you're going to be writing a second-rate me, right. write a first-rate you. And, but here's the core of what I saw in the character. Use it, don't use it, whatever. Just be honest to the character. If the character is solid, uh, you don't want to change that element of the character. If I'm thinking about what somebody's going to do 20 years from now, I'm not actually concentrating on what I'm doing. Uh, it has to work for you today yeah. and hope that, you know, I didn't even hope that these characters would be around. I never expected them to be. When George Perez and I worked, started the Teen Titans, books at that particular point at DC were being canceled by issue six. Mm. We figured we would do six issues of the Titans exactly the way we always wanted a superhero book to be, and then when it was canceled, we'd go on to it. I wrote the book for 16 years, you know, uh, every month, uh, over 250 stories. So you don't expect that going in. You just want to do at least we decided we were going to do exactly what we wanted. Shade is my first ongoing, and like that's kind of what I want to do. I'm just like, well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So it's like I might as well just do whatever the hell I want now because, you know, rather than rather than like be like, oh, what's the market forces or whatever. Yeah, it's because like, nobody knows. No, Absolutely yeah. nobody knows what the market wants or doesn't want, yeah. and it changes by the minute. Uh, and if you listen to every, no, they want this. They don't want this. They, that's not true. What the only thing everybody wants when they pluck down three ninety five, three ninety nine for a book or whatever it costs today, is a good story. Right, a good story. And what makes up that good story, God knows. Nobody has the slightest idea. So you can only do what's inside yourself and make yourself happy. Nothing makes me happier than to see the characters that I created uh, with God knows how many really good artists out there. Uh, still stay popular 30, 40 years later, because Titans was 1980, mm. and Deathstroke was created exactly the same time as the rest of the Titans. So what is that now, 40? 37. 37 years, thank you, I can't add. <laughs> I can. So 37 years later, these characters are still viable. That is more important to me 
than if they follow what I'm doing, what I specifically did. Because that's a greater tribute. I feel like that's our toast to a fucking good story. To a fucking good story. <laughs> It's been so great talking with yes, you guys. Yes, seriously. Absolutely. I feel like this I've learned fun. so much. And this was fun. Yeah, I feel like. Yeah, Marv, thank you so much just for your oh, everything on. that you. Well, come on, no, no, Marv, no. you're amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for gracing us with your presence and your stories. Oh. <laughs> Get off my back. <laughs> <laughs>